In law enforcement or security settings, how can training in body language enhance the detection of suspicious behavior? All right. Well, that's one of the main things you look for. It's one of the main things you're trained to look for right out of the gate. Because you're looking for someone who not only looks nervous, and sometimes a nurse is different kinds of nerves, right? You've got the kind of nervous where, for example, if you're um, in the military and you're at an outpost and you're, um, as you stand there, somebody starts, and you're in the Middle East <clears throat> and someone's walking toward you, what can they look nervous, quote unquote? What kind of nervousness are you seeing? Are you seeing the kind of nervousness where, um, as they do, sometimes they're coming up to touch you and run off when the younger people, and because that's like a little game they play sometimes, to see who can who can touch one of the soldiers, touch an American. Are you seeing nervousness from someone who wants to 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 meet an American to talk to one for the first time? And just kind of see what's going on. They may not be able to speak the same language, but just connect with an American. What kind of nervousness are you seeing there? Are you seeing the, the type of nervousness that tells you they've got? you know, four pounds of C4 strapped to their, around their stomach. They're going to blow everybody up once they get up to you. What kind of nervousness are you seeing? And those are very, each one of those is very different. So what you're looking for, for um, in law enforcement and TSA and those kind of things is someone who is almost quite often they're, they're, they're too perfect. They're too still. There's no one with them. Usually a lot of times, not all the time, obviously, but the ones you usually look at are the ones that are by themselves and they don't look at very many people and they do, they stand around, the movements are kind of tight and they'll, they're trying to, to look normal. You know, that's one of the things you try to do is try to look normal, but looking normal and looking like nothing's happening. That's a thing in itself because you do things that you don't think anybody's watching you. You'll do those things. You'll scratch places, you'll pick your nose or, you dig in your mouth or your tooth or something. So those are the kind of things you look for um, to be missing when someone is suspicious. Quite often when, when someone approaches them to talk to them, uh, it could be someone from the airport or the security people bringing them the dogs by or something like that. They'll stiffen up or they'll, you, they'll, they'll literally look nervous. There'll be things where they start pulling on their face or they'll just tighten up or start doing this kind of thing or, You'll see adapters. Sometimes some of them are really cool, and they you don't see anything on them, so it's really tough to spot. But you, I, I don't want to go in depth on this for obvious reasons. But there are things you do look for, and that's just that's just the the top layer of things you look for. But there are things you look for in that when you're doing that. There there are airports where that's all they do is is look for people to do that. Most airports, a lot of airports have that that capability and they do it there's one or two that do it constantly and there are people there that are trained to do that to watch everyone and these people will stick out because you see a, a normal flow of people and then in that normal flow you'll see that one person stick out like a little red flag sometimes they'll just behave differently there's a show on tv i can't remember what the, remember what the name of the show is and they're always looking for people carrying drugs, and they get them quite often. And when they do, you see all these cues that tell you that person is carrying something they shouldn't. Not the obvious ones where they have like this one woman had on these shoes that were like this high, and they're like tennis shoes. And they just crammed a bunch of uh, drugs in there and talked her into to traveling with those shoes on with all the drugs in there. One guy had on a toupee, and under the toupee, his toupee was like this high, and he had a bunch of drugs stuck up under there. So that's those are the ones that stick out like that. But there are things that, that you look for and things that you see in those situations that are actually specific to the nervousness that comes along with what they're doing. I don't know how to explain it any differently without saying too much. How does the alignment or misalignment of body language between couples predict relationship long, long, longevity? Longevity? Dyslexia is horrible. This doesn't have that dyslexic font on it, so it's tough for me to read. Quite often, one of the main things that I, I, uh, I think it was a therapist saw or realized that when couples are one one member of the couple is talking, the other one will roll their eyes, and they notice that there was a certain percentage of divorce that goes through the roof for people like that when the person rolls their eyes, the other person. So that's something um, that I always thought was fascinating. And I got into it for a while there, and it was, but that was a long time ago. And 
So if you see that, if you see people who are dating, the people who are going to get married or who are married, you see when one of them starts talking, they roll their eyes not to be funny and not say they're they're trying to be cute or they're whatever. They're rolling their eyes for real. Mm, that's a problem there. So heads up. All right. What role does body language play in the animal kingdom? And uh, what can humans learn from these nonverbal communication forms? Uh, I, 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 everybody has that has a dog or a cat. They, you get to know your dog or cat, and especially dogs. They, they're really, they're emotional, and they'll show you a lot of things. And they'll do a lot of things that let like, you know that they want to do. They, of course, they want to go out and stuff. But if they want to hang out, if they just want to love on you, you know, they come and put their foot on you, and and scooch up next to you and lay on you, or they'll turn over and you rub their stomach or whatever. My dog Hattie, this little Chihuahua, what she does is. When I say, do you want to go outside? And she doesn't want to go, say if it's raining or it's too cold, her ears will go up and say, hey, let me ask you a question. Because every time I say, let me ask you a question, I want to ask her if we're going to eat, if she wants to go outside or whatever, you don't want to goof around, you don't want to play. And her ears will go up. And if she doesn't want to do it, the left ear goes back. I've noticed that. That means, no, I don't. So I don't know if it means that in all dogs. Everybody has to look at their their own dog. There's a channel I watch on YouTube. It's called Jaw Dropping Facts. I don't know why they call it that, but it's about pets and their body language. And they're always talking about dogs or cats. And that's what is Jaw Dropping Facts. I watch it all the time. And they get deep into these body language things for little animals, for, for dogs and cats. And they'll tell you if your dog is happy, if it's sad, if, you're, if you're things your cat likes or doesn't like. And I, I watch that a lot because I want to be able to connect with my dog and make sure that everything, you know, make sure she's cool. And and I'm doing things that she likes, you know, and she gets to do the things she wants to do as a dog. So check that channel out. It's it's awesome. Since I don't know anything about dog body language and mostly I deal with humans, then I would I would check that out. Jaw dropping facts, great uh, channel for uh, pet behavior for dogs and cats. How often do you spot deception as you go through your day? We talked last time about. You know, it says you see 200 people lie 200 times a day. Like I said before, who knows? It may be 10 times, maybe 30, maybe one, maybe. I don't think it's 200. That's a whole lot. But, I, you know, like anybody else, I see quite often. You know, though, any, anyone from the, it's, from, it's mostly the little tiny ones, the little, the little ones. How you doing today? I'm doing great, man. How you doing? And you can just tell with the tone of their voice and look on their face that they're not being honest with you. So there, there's, you know, a lot of them that you see that way. Or if you accidentally, let's say you're in the grocery store and you bump into somebody or you um, hit their kid or something, not hit their kid, but bump into their kid or something, and they go, you go, oh, I'm so sorry. They go, oh, that's okay. That's okay. It's not okay. Of course, they're bummed out. But it's, but the little kids usually don't have a problem with it. What I've seen, I've seen, I saw, I'm using that one because the other day I was in the store and saw this lady bump into a little kid and the, the kid the kid fell, you know, hit the ground. It didn't start crying or anything, but didn't bother it. Didn't didn't hurt it at all or anything. Hurt the little child. And the woman said, oh, I'm so sorry. I'm so sorry. And the mother was like, that's okay. That's okay. You know, because she was concerned for the child. So, see, it, it wasn't okay. It's never okay when somebody bumps your kid. Same thing for your dog or your cat. If somebody, you know, hits them or accidentally steps on them or something, you know, it's not cool. But, I, you know, I see, I think we, we probably all see the same amount every day, depending on what's going on or who you're talking to, you know. But, you know, several times a day. How does stress impact nonverbal communication and what are the telltale signs to look for? All right. We've talked about that on here before, too. But that's one of the things, if you're in interrogation, in an interrogation, that's what you look for is stress. And when you're talking to somebody like normally every day, Look for things as you speak with them. You're getting a baseline as you first engage with them, start talking to them, see how they look. When you first start talking to someone, pay attention to how they're breathing. They're breathing heavy, they're breathing light. So they're looking at you and talking to you. Is their head, you know, put to the side a little bit as that ear towards you as they're listening and they, they engaged. And if, as during the conversation, you may ask something, they start to answer, you'll see things happen where they'll straighten up a little bit and they'll get, start a lot of, of you know, illustrators coming out, they'll start gesturing a lot and their eyes may get a little bit wider and they may not blink a lot. Those are all signs of stress. You may see them use um, adapters. 
Adapters are the things we use to get rid of that built up stress and tension. So you know, they'll, they may do this and cover their neck or put their hand on their chest, or they may do something like this and pull on it, or they may start that business where they're pushing their face. That's called facial denting. They may do that and chew on their mouth, or they may, um, you know, clench their jaws a little bit. They may have a little take that comes up. They may go all the time. They may start sniffing real loud or going <clears throat> like that. Well, not that much. It's more of a little, it's more of a little bark than a, than a, a straight clearing. It's almost like a little cough. And so you may start seeing that. They may start blinking their eyes weird. Or some people, they'll, they'll, they'll have a little tick where they'll double blink or, and stuff like that. So you'll see those things ramp up. All kinds of little things like that. So look, if things if things are going fine, nothing changes, everything's good. But if things change, look at those changes and think about what you just asked or what the subject is. Because the subject itself may be, it doesn't mean they're being deceptive with you, but you ask about stress. So it may be a situation where their, their parent is sick and they haven't told anybody yet. Maybe they're sick and they haven't told anybody yet. Maybe some of they, excuse me, somebody they love is sick and haven't, they haven't told anybody yet. Maybe their dog just passed away. Something like that. You, ne you never know. So that's what's making the stress go up. Or maybe they, you're talking about money or getting a car or something, and they want really, one really badly, but they can't afford one right now. So maybe that causes that would be the cause of the stress for them. So that's, those, those are some little things to look for. And start looking at it. But look for them. In a lot of cases, they'll start shutting down almost. And they'll try to get away from that, that specific sh subject quite often, not all the time. So those are the things I look for. Uh, do you believe there might be a significant significant number of neurodivergent analysts who do so well in their field because they're able to pick up on subtle on uh, pick up subtle cues more effectively than neurotypical people? Um, maybe you know when you theoretically you'd, you'd have to say, uh, hang on a second, it's Greg. See what he wants. Okay, uh, what was the question? Let me go back and see. Oh, yeah, do you believe there would be a significant number of them? You never know. I mean, um, theoretically, there could be, and theoretically, there would be some, because they'll be able to focus on specific things, but it depends on what kind of, of neurodivergent person you're talking about. Because a lot of times, an autistic person, they they don't see the same the same. Uh, emotions that we see on faces and things they're they're emotional they have feelings all that stuff is is intact and and they a lot of, quite often they're lonely you know because they want to connect with people but they don't know how you know so that's that's always tough that's always the saddest about that but uh, depending on the the type of, of neurodivergent person you're talking about maybe some are you know maybe some aren't some people will be able to to see a lot of of um different things on someone and categorize them once they understand what those are or are educated on that to be able to, to spot things go oh, okay this may mean this or may mean that so it's a it's a possibility you know theoretically you would think yes but i don't know because i don't know about any studies on that so i can't tell you yes or no on that and that's one of my things i'm hardcore about if i can't prove it through studies and go back and say oh here's who did it here did it. i'm not going to tell you anything about it so I don't want you to think I'm telling you something about it because I don't know. Um, do you have suggestions on tools that help non-medical people learn the brain better than just going on Google down the Google rabbit trail? Um, that's a good one because I'm on Google a lot looking for studies. And you can find, you can still stay on Google and, and find good stuff. My my problem is when when body language experts quote unquote go on Google, they just say you know uh, how do you know if someone's lying? And they say oh, and they hear all those old things we talked about before, like the seven thirty eight fifty five rule of communication, which we know it's not it's a myth. Um, you know, you scratch your nose, and it means something. You look this way, it means something. You look that way, it means something. All those things, those are the things you got to watch out for. So don't search for things like that unless you go in and you say. Uh, let's say, um, let's pick a part of the brain. Let's, let's pick the um, mid-temporal gyrus study. So put mid-temporal gyrus plus sign study, and then uh, university or plus university study. Those kind of things. Or if you've got one, you think, I think I heard this from Harvard. I think I heard this from Purdue. I think I heard this from UCLA. 
then put, you know, plus UCLA and see what pops up. And if you want to really nerd out, because you're getting, if, if you're into that, really, you're getting ready to jump down a hole that is never ending. And if you're into it, it's wonderful. I mean, you can find it all in there, a lot of it. And you can go check and make sure this person exists. You can go on and say, is that person really there? Is this true? And you can back it up that way. I have to do that all the time because, like I've said before, I can't give give the people I train information that isn't true and isn't backed up that I don't know for sure has been proven by scientific study because it might get them killed. So I, 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 don't, I don't do that, and I don't, I don't conjecture about I'll tell you, in my experience, this has happened, and in my experience, that has happened. I can do that, but I'll always end it and say, but there are no studies that I'm aware of about that, or if there are some, I haven't looked into them, I haven't found any, and so I don't know. So, But you can go down, you can get in. Don't be afraid to go in there and get in that rabbit hole and look around, because, man, you can find some really good stuff. It's And... and, and Let's talk Kindle, because I always talk about Kindle in here, because they have that open dyslexic font, so I can read on it. You can send whatever PDFs you download, and that's another thing. You don't you can't, you can't don't have to just read it on the net, man. You can download the PDFs of these studies and get all that information from them. It's, it's great for that. And you can have them sent to your Kindle. Do you know that? And if you put um, convert in the subject line of the email when you send it to your Kindle... It'll put it in that dyslexic font for you or whatever font you're reading. It'll it'll convert it into that font. So do that. Get those things. Get in there and, and look for those studies. Any studies you're interested in on the brain, any neurological stuff, it's all on there because universities are constantly uploading that stuff. You know, it's 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 awesome. If you have a Kindle scribe, then it just it prints it out. It doesn't print it out, puts it on your Kindle and you can read it like I don't have mine down here. But it it puts it in a in a almost in a um, iPad size thing where you can read it really easily. And the battery lasts forever. What is the main beha- behavior or sign you might see in someone about to commit violence or harm in public? Those are pre-violence cues you're looking for. Depending on what kind of violence you're talking about, it's a broad statement. Let's pretend. Let's do two of them. Let's say the person is going to um, fight somebody. You know, you'll see all the you'll see the classics. You know, you'll see you'll see the the hands come down, the cut off, and the shoulders come back a little bit, and the chest goes out because they're acting all tough and stuff. But as soon as that foot backs up a little bit, you get one foot that goes goes back a little bit, and they lean back. That means they're getting ready to come forward. There's a lot of things you, you can look for in those things. You'll see like and the classics are quite often the fists will ball up. You'll see that because they'll be ready. They won't necessarily go into that thirty style boxing stance or anything. But they're getting ready. Who you got to watch out for are these jujitsu guys, man, because they would they if if they'll tear you apart. There's you can't defend against that stuff. I don't think it's funny. I think it's hilarious watching somebody who thinks they're just awesome. And there's a, a, somebody who's into ju, jujitsu. It's been into it for a while, and they try to fight one of those guys, and you can't do it. Normal old fighting can't. You can't do it. It's impossible. They'll be swinging at them and everything else. And these people just grab them and they tie them up and they get on top of them and squish them in this weird knot and they can't do anything. And they're this close to like breaking an arm or a leg or something like that. Tons of that on YouTube and it's hilarious. So, um, so anyway, um, so you want to watch out for, and they get that stare going, those eyes get all big. Now there's a difference in someone being angry and they pretend they're pretending they're angry. Like when they're pretending they're angry, they'll do this. You see those eyes do like that and they get that look on their face. If you watch their eyes, here's what you're looking for. When somebody's really angry, they'll do that. They'll, you know, you see that. But what you want to see, see, I can still see the whites of my eyes. That is how you can tell when those, that bottom part of your eye starts squishing up like that. That's when they're really mad, and the the lips really tighten. It's not just, you know, you do whatever. I just no. So. That's that's what you want to look for is, is the the watch the eyes starting to disappear and then it's 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 on at that point it's coming and then right before it happens what you want to look for is a lot of people say oh you you know their face will go it'll turn white or you know gray because all the blood leaves because it's true it goes they go to the arm the muscles and the and things you'll need and to to help you breathe and get your your oxygen to the blood because you're getting ready to do something that's that's you know a lot of work a lot lots going to be going on. But the, th- the key is, like quite often, let's say somebody's interrogating someone, and um, 
they're as they talk to them and the person they know is getting mad and you you see the the face gets all red so you you want to look for that then all of a sudden that red goes away then you say uh oh okay get ready because because as soon as that red comes back that's when they're coming at you it's not just because it goes away it's when it comes back as soon as it comes back here they come because the decisions have been made and they're going to swing at you so if you don't get out of the way, out of the way they might chip your tooth or they might just no tell what'll happen and if you're sitting there watching oh i see what's happening Okay, yeah, his face is red. and Okay, oh, wow, look at that. Now it's gone pale. Oh, it's red again. Okay, yeah, he's going to swing. And if you don't get out of the way, you're going to get hit. So, or, or more than that. Usually it's, it's, it's a, you know, they try to do all that they're going to try to do. So you really got to be careful with that. Those are the things that, so those are some, just a few of the pre violence things to look for. Uh, besides law enforcement and the criminal justice field, what are the careers would be good for someone who would like to get some body language training? There's always psychology. You can be a psychologist or a therapist. You know, you have to you have to understand body language in those because, especially in a therapist situation, because if someone is is if they're depressed but they're acting like they're not, you'll see cues that tell you they're not. And as you go through that, you'll say certain things. You'll see the emotions. That, change on their face. They're, sometimes they're not big, sometimes they're small, and you'll see them sort of pop on for a minute and go away, or slowly morph from one to the other. Sometimes it happens a little quicker. Depending on, excuse me, what the subject is, I just ate hot chicken. I don't know if you've ever had Hattie Bees before, but man, if you get the real hot stuff, then will knock your head off. Anyway, but I love it. Um, so you have to know, you have to know body language, and, and those things are understand um, behavior from an emotional perspective, what you're looking for. Um, what else would be a good one? But it's, I don't know if you're asking about where to get training or what or good, some good um, careers to get in where you would get that while you're in there. You know, obviously, um, the ones you talked about, law enforcement and that kind of thing, and the military. So uh, there's a lot in sales. You know, you know, I do sales things all the time. I have this thing called see more, sell more. And it really works because it, you, it depends on what you're, as you look at someone, you can tell if they're into it or not, if you're wasting your time or if they're just there because someone has said, hey, look, you, you go in there and talk to this guy. You know, he's here to sell something. How do you know that? How do you know you're wasting your time? How do you know that you've got them on the hook? How do you know they're not just saying, well, we're not really sure about that. But they really want it, and they're playing the game of of hard to get and trying, and that's part of their negotiation situation, or ritual. You know, how do you know those things? So when you get into to sales, which is a great spot to learn about behavior, because I train those people all the time. You know, big sales conventions, everything, and and it's things that not only help you understand what they're saying, but be able to connect with someone. That's the most important thing. People like to do business with people they like. So you've got to get in there and 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 get them to like you a lot, and then start thinking along the lines of of, of being analytical about it. So there are ways around that and ways to do that, you know. So connections is the main thing in uh, learning about behavior, even in interrogation. You've got to connect with that person. A lot of people go in and they'll keep that wall up between them. It's all like, yeah, I'm asking you questions, and that's a and I'm sure they that works a lot. I'm sure, but you don't get all the information you could possibly get when you when you approach it that way. And that's my experience, anyway. Over the years in your line of work, what mental illnesses and personality disorders do you see most frequently? Now, since you said most frequently, most people are normal. Not, they can't be normal if they're, if they're doing something they shouldn't supposed to be, to be doing. They can't be totally normal. But sometimes people do make mistakes, and they'll see a shot and they'll take it. Quite often, if you're dealing with people who are embezzling, they'll find out they can do it by accident. You know, or somebody who's stealing money from the cash register, that kind of thing. They'll, uh, there was one place that I had to go in and talk to somebody about. Uh, they were, they did it. So I don't have to be careful about this. I don't even tell where it was. This girl had been stealing money from uh, this place she worked. It was a, a really expensive place. But there's a lot of cash that came through because a lot of tourists. This was in Nashville. And so she, what she was doing, what tipped him off 
Well, she was buying people stuff. She's buying like this guy she likes. She was buying him clothes, but he was taking the, you know, was, he shouldn't have been doing that. But she'd bring him all these really expensive things. And then she was buying people these expensive gifts. And then as they talked to her, they're like, well, what do you do outside of here? She's like, no, I, I just work here. They knew she didn't do anything else. They knew she wasn't like a, a one of those millionaires that don't want, doesn't want anybody to know. And they're just working too. So and she'd been stealing from the thing. So getting getting in there and getting her to tell uh, that what happened wasn't that wasn't hard at all. But she realized she could she could not put all the money in. And every time somebody paid hundred bucks, she would keep twenty bucks. That kind of thing. There's another situation at a bank where this girl, people would come up and they would give cash. And she would write out a receipt and give them cash. Oh, no, she wouldn't give them the receipt, but they would drop the cash off. And they would say, okay, thank you. And as they went along, this woman would just keep the cash. It could be $10,000, and she would just keep it. And it was a lot. I mean, it, was, it ended up being a lot that she, had, that she had taken that way in this bank. And she just discovered she could do this. She said, you know, but I could do that. There's no way they could track it until finally people started saying, hey, Wait a minute, where's I, I put in this much money on this date and all that? That's how they busted her. And I'm sure at first they think, okay, I can get away with this and I'll just do it a couple of times. But what happens is this. And you don't think about this until you see people in this situation. They start creating a lifestyle around that extra income. So they start getting all these things, you know, they'll get um, uh, start payments on a car or they'll, they'll, um, start upgrading their, their kitchen or redo the kit, or they'll, you know, get a bunch of, um, uh, upgrades on things, you know, cause they're, they're used to that money coming in. So they can't stop doing it. That's what usually happens at banks. People will, will discover a way they can take money and they think nobody will ever know. And most of the time, most of the time, I'm sure there's a few have gotten away. They, they get caught, you know, and a lot of times the bank will catch that person or that person will be caught and the bank doesn't want to tell anybody about it because they don't want people to think they've, they've hired people or there are people in there that are taking their money. So they're in a, a lot of times a little situation where it's really tough for them to deal with, you know. But usually people find out by accident they can start getting all this money. So that's really interesting. Oh, but you asked me about, as I'm looking at this again, uh, what mental illnesses. Um some of them are, are kind of sad because that person gets in trouble and apparently nobody sat down and talked to them because there's they'll either be a schizophrenic or they'll be um, they'll um, be a manic depressive and they don't care what happens. And you can tell as soon as you walk in the first five minutes, you go, oh, this person, this doesn't look good. I think this must be, you know, really depressed as we're talking about this because they don't care about anything or, or what your approach, whatever your approach is in your interrogation. And um, but I mean, you think all oh, the psychopaths everywhere, there are a lot of them, you know, but you don't see them all the time. You really don't, you know, a lot of, a lot of murders aren't, aren't done by psychopaths just because somebody murders somebody and it's really horrible. doesn't mean they're a psychopath. That's, there's a lot of hate involved with those. A lot of times, a lot of, um, um, people have been mad at this person for forever and they get their shot or something happens and they take it and they just, then they off that person. You know, so it doesn't mean they're a psychopath just because they're killing people. They can quite often. You do see a lot, depending on what it is, you'll see narcissism because they're, they're, they are they're think they're so smart they can't get caught. Those are my favorites because those are easy to deal with because you can see it on them. And if you know how to approach that, then you just get in there and it, all that is is an ego that you're dealing with. And basically, when you deal with a narcissist, look at it as an ego, not even a person. And you can get this person to do anything you want anything you want. There was a situation where this girl is a narcissist and I knew it. And I knew her mother was as well. And my buddy was married to her. Right. And I said to my buddy, I told him, I said, just a heads up, you're married to a narcissist. Didn't want to believe it. I said, and his mother, her mother is a narcissist as well. So what I'm going to do is I'm going to show you how that works. And I'm going to show you, you can control the situation or, or that I know what I'm talking about because you're going to watch because the mother was at their house all the time. I said, and you're going to see this woman, she's going to wait on me hand and foot. Every time I'm over here, she's going to absolutely love me and she's going to bring me things She's and I will have her cook for me. And she, and I told her what they're going to make. It's going to be salmon. I said, she'll make me salmon and then she's going to make me this little pasta thing the next time I come over. You wait and see. 
So this went on for a while. And she was doing everything I told him she was going to do because all that is is an ego you're dealing with. And if you know how to to, to um, talk to that ego and please it and have it do things where it makes it feel good and feel even smarter and feel even more powerful, then you can control it. And finally, this guy and his wife said, you got to stop doing this. You got to stop doing this. You know, my buddy said, look, man, this is crazy. You got you to quit doing that. We, I'm uncomfortable with it. You know, my wife is uncomfortable with it. I said, okay, I just wanted you to know you're dealing with that as well. And come to find out years later, I was right about that as well. So she was a, a narcissist too. And that's not good for anybody when you're married to 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 that, um, that mental illness. Yeah, you can look at it like that. That's, that's the way I like to see it because they do things that are, that are, uh, that you'd never do to your children. They they ignore them and they do things that are all about them. It's always all about them. That's what the, the narcissist is about. So if you understand that and you can do things, you don't have to, to be subservient to it. That's not what I'm saying at all because then it'll start taking advantage of you. There's a way to go about doing it. If you will take advantage of that and you just see it as a, a this big white ball and all it is, or yellow balls, the way I say it. And all that is, is is an ego. And if you treat it correctly, it'll do anything you want for a while. It won't do it forever because pretty soon it'll figure out what's happening. You know, but I got it in and out quick enough where it didn't realize it. So there's that. But I, I don't see, there's not, there's, there's not a bunch of them that, that, that come up. But the ones I see the most, probably narcissism, but not every time. It's not like every person you deal with, not like not even one in five. You know, or, or maybe one in 10, two in 10. Well, that'd be one in five, wouldn't it? I don't know. It just depends. Does prolonged periods of isolation from others affect our body language? Yeah, it does. When they put people in um, the hole or isolation from all the other people in prison, all the other prisoners, these people, a lot of times, they'll lose their minds because people need people. And when they go in and talk to them, it takes a while to snap out of that or to get back to normal and act normal where they haven't been around anybody. So their 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 body language is, is all enclosed because they've been up in their head, not being able to talk to anybody, walking around in this little tiny room all by themselves. And a lot of times a lot of rocking that happens in there. So they come out, their eyes are big, and it takes a while to get to get out of that. That's why people hate it so much. Prisoners hate it when you put them in there. Because it, it's you're little, literally isolating them from other people, from the world. And they get no information in, and they can't get any information out. They just scoot food, and this little thing flops up, and they put food in it. That's it. That's the only communication you have is that tray coming through that little door. And it can drive you nuts if you don't watch it. So, yeah, your body language changes once you're not around people a lot. Now, let's take that thing where it'd be with me and you. Right. So you may be in a situation where there there are a lot of people, you may have moved somewhere, and there are not a lot of people around. So that sometimes that can be depressing because you 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 try to connect with people at the store and you you talk. You know, sometimes people a little that are a little older and they don't they don't live with anybody, say their person has passed away, their husband or wife, and they'll go out to the store and you always you notice this nice little old lady or this nice little man. They're trying to connect because they don't connect anywhere else. So when you're in the store and somebody's like that and they're, they're and it seems they're a little bit talking too much or they're too nice sometimes, connect with that person because they're probably lonely. And you may be the only person that talks with them that day. And you may be the person that makes their day. Well, don't you look pretty today? Well, thank you so much. Because nobody's telling them that. Nobody's telling them that. Nobody. So if you see somebody like that, be nice to them. Be extra nice to them. Because they can when, when you get isolated like that, that... That that's bad. That's that's so sad when that happens, and it happens all the time. And you're seeing people all the time like that. You just don't realize it. You just don't realize it. So talk to those people a little bit. Connect with them. That's what they 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 love that, and you'll make their day. How is it possible to read someone whose language we don't understand? Well, watch one of those movies or watch a uh, a channel where they don't speak English, and watch them. It could be the news. It could be. Um, Whatever it is, and watch them. You'll see if if you under, have a, even the 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 slightest understanding of body language and human behavior, you'll start understanding what's happening really quickly. People are people. People are the same. With body language, everything starts. It's either limbic or cultural. 
So you'll see things from a, a perspective, for example, when Japanese people get get embarrassed or or you'll do something that they don't like, quite often they'll smile. They smile. You know, we well, wouldn't do that. We'd be like, as Americans, well, what do you tell you? What, you got a problem? You know, it'd be that kind of thing. But they'll smile, especially when they're they're embarrassed. We'll go, ooh, but they'll smile real big. There'll be, in other countries, there are different things people do like that. So once you knock all that out of the way and you get rid of those, um, the, the, like uh, another one, for example, let me stop there one second. In India, instead of going like this, they go like this when they say yes. When they're excited, they'll do that. So those are just a couple, to give you a couple examples of the differences in the cultural part, part of body language. But when you get down to the neurological part of body language, people are people. We're all the same. So there'll be things you see when someone gets angry, you'll see the anger expressions are the same, the happiness expressions are the same, the uh, contempt is the same. All those things are the same. The facial expressions are all the same. It's just those big body language things when it comes to communicating with other people, when you're dealing with another person, those things are the ones that change, the big ones. You know, how you greet someone, how close you stand to somebody, those kind of things. But the basics of it are the same because we're all people. We all have a brain. We all have a spinal cord. We all have a, a, a nervous system. We all have a limbic system. And that, those things all function the same. You, you, there's no change in there. So outside of that, as you branch branch out, you get into the, the communication part of it where you're talking to people and getting to do things or, or being friends and all that. That's different. That's where things change. But other than that, they we're all the same. Are you ever able to... Are you ever ever able to turn your analyzing off, or do you always notice people's body language in everyday conversations? We talked about that last time, and like I told you before, um, you you no, you say you do, but you don't because people say, "Oh," and they, say, they go, "What is it? What do you do?" I, well, I, I'm a speaker. Oh, what do you, what do you, that's what I say because I want to go. I'm an interrogator. You know, nobody wants to hear that <clears throat> because. The first thing they think is really, well, tell me about that or that kind of thing. And they'll say, they always say, well, oh, I better watch my body language. I better not cross my arms and all that kind of thing, which I understand they're trying to connect, but they tell you the first thing they know about body language that it is incorrect. And it's so tough not to go. Well, you know, the, the crossing the arms really doesn't mean much. Everybody thinks it does because you've always thought that. And then going to this big four minute spiel about behavior and why crossed arms mean nothing. You know, because they say, I've got to watch where I look and all those kind of things. And again, you go, you're going to cut right into that stuff. But he'll tell people you can turn it off. Because try to get somebody to go, if, if you're a body language expert or an analyst or an interrogator, try to get somebody to go have coffee with you. Try to get somebody to go to Starbucks with you. Especially if you don't know them very well, you just meet them. No, nah, they're not going to go. Believe me, not going to go. Because they're going to be nervous. So that's another thing. If you're talking to your friends, don't say, oh, I'm, I'm into body language and learn all about it. Look at these books I'm reading. Don't do that. Don't do that. Because they'll think, oh, this person's reading my body language now. They're going to know how I feel about something or what I might think about something or I might need to lie to them. And they're going to know. Don't tell anybody. No. Keep it to yourself. That way you can become a powerful tool. I should be saying, tell everybody and tell them about this channel and all that stuff. No. Nah. Keep it to yourself, because if you keep it to yourself, you'll learn so much more. Other people are into it. You can talk to them about it. If, if they're mouthing off or something and they don't know that, see what they know. There's nothing wrong with it, because no matter what situation you're in, this is, this is the way I approach life. No matter if that person is a beginner or the best one in the world, because I learned this from, from dealing with a lot of musicians, you'll learn something. You'll learn something that person, I don't care if they've been playing for two weeks. My dad was a piano player, awesome piano player, guitar player, awesome guitar player. He was a session guy in Nashville as he was going to medical school at Vanderbilt, okay? And what he would do, even in his, his late 70s, he died a couple of years ago at 85, even in his late 70s, early 80s, he was always getting these beginner books. And I was like, what? And when I was younger, I was like, you know, you know, what are you talking about? When I first started going to Berkeley, I said, why are you still reading this beginner stuff? What are you doing? He said, you can always learn something about these beginning chords and the way different people use what are called passing chords as you move from one chord to another as the song changes and all that, and arrangements. 
And I thought, oh, he said, no matter how simple it is, somebody's going to do something different in there. You can always learn something from that. So I, I took that to heart. And so th- not long after that's when I started doing sessions because like, oh, that makes that's brilliant. That makes a lot of sense. So I started approaching it that way as well. Everything from drums to keyboards to guitar, everything else that I played, you know, and I would always learn something. So in body language, you can do the same thing. No matter what somebody has, has no matter how far into it they are, talk to them about it. I talk to people about it every day. Some people say, I've just got into body language, but I read your book or uh, I saw you talk at whatever it was, or I watch your your videos or this, that, and the other thing. And they'll always tell you something they just learned. Always tell you something. And I gather, I'll do what? And they go, oh, yeah, the whatever it is. I'm like, and I don't go, oh, well, I knew that. I never do that because I don't act like I know everything because I don't. So I say, what are, you, what are you talking about? Who said that? And then it starts getting on their nerves because I try to get it. And they, they, a lot of times they won't have remembered exactly where they got it. So I got to go look it all up. But still, I got some good information, something new that I can use and check out and make sure and go down that rabbit hole we were talking about a minute ago and find studies and stuff on it and see if they exist. So that's no matter what happens, no matter how far somebody is into something, ask them questions, talk about it. Even if, they, if they're a beginner, it's like one of the best people to talk about because they want to talk about it. They'll tell you something and you will learn something from that. So even though you um, go through your day, and once you start learning about body language, which we talked about, and you, and you may use some of the things we talk about in your daily life, um, you'll find you can't turn it off either. That'll start dawning on you. And you don't want to tell anybody that. I'm telling you this because you asked me, and this is what I'm doing here. But you'll, you'll, you'll start, you'll, I don't know how to explain it, actually. Because <clears throat> as you go through your day, and you see people you know and you've known for years, the first thing you want to know, because if you haven't seen them for a while, let's say it's a neighbor down the street, and you haven't seen them in two weeks. Well, what's going on? And they start telling you, dang, a little tool's come on. You're making sure that they're being, not that you're making sure they're being honest with you, but you're seeing if something makes them stressed. If And not that you don't believe them, but you want to, you can't help it. You can't help it. So you try and you tell everybody you do, but you don't. I don't. I can't. Nobody I know can. It's like this. Nobody. Thus they all say, oh, yeah. Because I always say, oh, yeah, it doesn't work that way. Don't worry about that. It does work that way. All right. What are some ways of de- detecting dishonesty over the phone? All right. This is a good one. Because, well, it depends on who you're dealing with. Um, quite often when somebody is is giving you information about something, let's say you ask them a question about <clears throat> a car that you might buy from or something. As you ask them these questions, do that thing I'm always telling you about where you ask a question and you wait, you don't say anything after they answer, you just sit there and see if they add any qualifiers to that answer. See if they add anything to it to make that answer more believable. Now, if it's a car, they may be saying, be trying to tell you how wonderful it is. But when you ask about specific problems with it and they give you the answer, wait. Sometimes they'll say, are you still there? Oh, yeah, yeah, yeah. Okay. And you keep talking. But do that. Because attorneys do that. They're great at it. You know who else does that? Episcopal priests. They'll do that. They they will, you'll ask them a question, and or they'll ask you a question, and you'll answer it, and then they'll just wait and see what you add to it. Not that they think you're being dishonest or or anything, but they want you to talk more. They're trying to get you to, to talk more. Uh, another one that does it are, sometimes you'll see Methodist preachers, for some reason, they'll do that. When you give them information, and then they'll wait, and you give them some more, and give them some more. So from the clergy world, those are the two that stick out the most for me there. In the business world, it's or in the regular world, it's attorneys. They do it. They're trained to do it because they talk to somebody like me, and that's what we train to do. I train attorneys, and I tell them that's what you need to do to get as much information as you possibly can. So as you as you answer, and they and they don't answer you back. So say they ask you a question, you answer, and they wait. What you can do is keep waiting. Don't say a thing. Don't say you're still there. Nothing. <clears throat> just sit there. Wait for them to say something. And what they'll do is they won't say, are you there? They'll say, okay, well, what about so-and-so? And they'll know you're on to them and they'll quit it. So that's what I would suggest for that. How long does it take to become a body language expert? All right, that's a good question. It could take, I don't know, to be honest with you, because I've been doing it since I was a little kid. I've been 
been interested in, in behavior and body language since I was I was six or seven years old. I told you about that before. So I don't know. I would assume it would take 15 years, 10, 15, 20 years, depending on how deep in you get to it. It may take five years. Some people probably get granted at five years. I don't know. You know, it depends on on your the approach that person has to it. Is this something they're just casually reading about it and understanding it? Or are they focused on that or reading studies and educating themselves on it, like college? You know, are you re reading about it every day? Are you searching for things every day that tell you about that? How interested are you really in it? That would be my question to the person. Or as I looked at him, was assessing whether they were um, into it or not. You know, how into it are they? What do they know so far? So it could take anywhere from five years, 10, 15 years, you know, 20. So I guess I'm <laughs> about 50 something years in. So I started when I was six or seven. So that's, it, it took me, I'm, I'm sure a while to have a full understanding of it and go, oh, I'm really into this. I, I, I'm going to, you know, I'm going to use this tool all the time professionally. So, but I use it all the time in, in the, in the record business and the music business as we pitch our acts and bands and artists, you have to go into a label and you say, a lot of it's relationships. So you don't go into a label and have a big meeting like they show on TV shows and stuff. Quite often it's just somebody, you know, hey, listen, man, here's what I got. Okay, come play for it. Let me hear it. And they'll say, okay, you'll go to the meeting. It'll be the A&R person and somebody else. Go, okay, that sounds good. That sounds good. Let's see if we can, let's try to go, do something from here. I've never been on those meetings that go, sounds good, kid. I'm going to sign it. We're all going to be millionaires. Nothing like that. That's all kind of business. And a lot of it, especially in Nashville, is relationships. It, it's just getting to know that person and somebody that knows them say, dude, I know who'd love this. And you, know, you got to go talk to so-and-so at Warner Brothers. You got to talk to so-and-so at Capitol. You got to go talk to so-and-so at, you know, Arista when that was around. And that that's the way it was, was relationships. But then you have situations where you just go out and you start shopping. You do have those meetings and every now and then, man, you'll score on one of those. Anyway, it's all about relationships, um, depending on where you are. New York's a little bit different. You, you know, that's more of the, you go into the office and you, and you pitch that way. But I, I use those tools in body language to uh, pitch these acts. And I would teach the, the people we were pitching how to act and talk as well. So they would be accepted by whatever person we, would, we were dealing with. If it was someone from Nashville, how to talk like, but I'd research that person if I didn't know them, if we were into one of those. I'd find out how old they were, so I knew what they thought was cool. Are they going to say things like, well, that's the cat's pajamas, you know, like the old stuff. I'd find out what the vernacular was for that age group, so I could throw a couple of things in there. I'd find out what kind of sports they liked, so I could maybe wear a, a hat or a shirt or have one of them wear a hat or a, a baseball shirt if it was baseball or football or whatever. They're from Alabama. I'd have them wear, a, you know, just something to let them know that they were in Alabama and they love the team. So if it came up, they could connect that way. A lot of little things. One of those things won't work just by itself. You have to have so many little things together that will help you connect with people. So th those are just some um, some ways that I would use it to to help get it would help in the music business. Not only that, but when you're producing a record and you're dealing with people, a different um, person or a different group every couple of months, every, say, three months, every how long it takes you to make their album, three or four months, then the next one comes in and you start that one. You have to be able to talk to those people as well. So you have to instantly be able to um, understand the kind of person you're dealing with and then connect with them. So that's that's the way it would help as well. I'd use the tools like that as well. Mm -hmm. And when you're dealing with people in the music business, quite often you're dealing with egos. Sometimes you're not. In the studio, it's completely different because you can have someone with the biggest ego in the world and they come in the studio and the cool ones will go, I'm not good at this. I'm, I, I don't really don't understand. Let's, let's, you have to walk me through this or you'll have to, whatever you tell me, I'll do it. Just let's, let's get through this and because and, you're going to be able to see this from a, a position I can't see. Those are always the coolest people to work with and they did the best. So, but then you have some people with egos that here's how I'm doing it. You know, um, I remember Charlie Daniels. I did his first gospel album, Songs of, from the Longleaf Pines. It was a bluegrass record. He wanted to do a bluegrass gospel record. And he called me and Scotty, I want to do this record. And, and uh, I wanted Mac Wiseman to be on it. And I want Earl Scruggs to be on it. And Ricky Skaggs, I know you know all them. Let's gather everybody up. And I said, well, okay, let me call them. I'm sure they want to do it. And, uh, and the whites they were on too. And, so I, and I said, okay, yeah. I, and I had this little group of guys I used all the time for bluegrass stuff. And it's the same guys. It was like my 
number one call for these guys, right? And they were in a famous bluegrass band. Still are. And when the first time that he came in the studio, this is this is what he was one of those guys that knew exactly what he wanted to do. And no matter what, but he would still check with you and say afterwards, say, what do you think about this? How's it sound to you? And we have to sit down and listen to it. But he would come in and do this. The first time he came in, it was like he called and said, All right, well, what time after we made the plans and we and we uh had the the uh in this situation, what we did is I got a, I used a couple of different bands to be the band for this. And we would go in and do, uh, or members from different bands. And we would go in and you, whatever the song is, we play it and get it, get the arrangement for it. How's it going to start? What's the verse? What are the verses going to be like? What are the pre-courses going to be like? The, usually in bluegrass, you don't have pre-courses. So we had to create pre-courses, do the chorus, and then you go back and there's this, a specific, uh, there's song form, you know, so how you arrange the parts of that song, that's when you talk about the structure and the, and the song form. So my thing was, I always try to make something sound as pop as possible so we can sell the most of it. I mean, art is there. You got to be artsy, but you still got to sell records or, or albums or make that person popular, or make them get a lot of downloads or listens. So the, the first day after we'd done all that stuff, and we waited a few days, let it all soak in, they're going to take a little break because from that day forward, we're going to work really hard for quite a while. And so Charlie said, I, he called me and he said, all right, so what, what time are we going to start? I said, nine o'clock. He said, okay. So he always called me, this guy, Scotty, what time are we going to start? I said, nine o'clock. He said, all right, I'll see you in the morning. So <laughs> it was, you now when you're in the studio, what happens is this usually, you have a nine o'clock start call, so I'll get there at nine. You know, as a producer, and it's you're the producer. You show up, and you and the engineer hang out for a while, and and talk, and eat something, and have coffee, and tell jokes, and make sure everything's good, and make sure the board is good, and make sure everything's working right, and all that. You know, and people slowly start getting. So if you say nine, people are going to be there by nine thirty, ten o'clock. You know, and for the vocals, because we'd already cut all the the instrument uh, stuff. For mo for the most part, we had the 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 basic tracks done. Then you go in and you trade um, for the guitar part. You, you just have the, the basic track. So you take that guitar part off and you put the real part on. Have the same person come in and they'll play that part perfectly because they've just got the idea down now. So basically you start switching out all the parts. And and then later on, um, like drums. I think on that record, I played all the drums on that record. Yeah. And did I think I did all the background vocals too. Anyway. No, the Whites did, and Ricky Skinner. No, we had a lot of people on there that were singing as well. The Whites did great on the background vocals on there. Great uh, bluegrass singer. And and not just bluegrass, fantastic singers. Uh, Ricky Skaggs is wife, or her family. And it was it was uh, 9 o'clock. And and me and this and my buddy Patrick, who was the engineer for that, uh, were... were we were sitting around talking at the time I smoked cigarettes. So we're sitting there smoking, talking, eh, thinking, you know, and talking about how excited we were because it was his first bluegrass record, but it was his first, it was a gospel bluegrass record. And he hadn't done one of those, and we were really excited about it. But we're thinking Grammys and all this stuff. We did he get nominated? Didn't win. I'm not bitter about that, but. And uh, so nine o'clock rolled around. Right, and we're and we're all relaxed because we're waiting on him. We figure it's Charlie Daniels, the guy's famous. So we figure, you know, he'll roll around, you know, sometime between nine, at least nine fifteen, nine thirty, maybe ten o'clock, whatever it is. We're gonna sit there and wait on him. It's Charlie Daniels. So, and this is the kind of guy he was. Tick, hit nine o'clock. Damn door opens up, and here he comes. And on the way through the studio, out to the vocal booth. Hey, Scotty. Hey, Patrick. What are y'all doing? How y'all doing this morning? Great, Charlie, what's happening? Ah, you ready to sing? Went in there. <laughs> We're like, what? And he goes in there, and he's and he's got on headphones. We can see him going, as he's tapping on the mic. And we get the mic turned on. He goes, I can't hear myself in here. I can't hear you. Y'all hear me in there? <laughs> he got in there. It started damn 9 o'clock. A minute hadn't passed because it was 9 o'clock, and there he was. Showed up 9 o'clock. We were right back in there. was tapping on the mic. I can't hear myself. Is everything on? <laughs> We're like, oh, God. Thank God we had the we had the, everything ready to go. We had the, the song on the right one, everything ready to go. Because usually we'll listen and do a little mix and make sure everything sounds good. We had done some of that already, but not, you know we didn't focus on it. He said, "All right, let's go." 
<laughs> and so he started doing his vocals then. And, uh, but, you know, we spent a, a couple of days doing that. But for the most part, everything he did was one shot for those. And I don't ever do that. I don't ever do that. I let him do one shot. And we go back through and correct and talk and do all those kind of things. Nope, not for him. Because he listened through and he said, what do you think? I said, okay, here's some things I want to change. And he would change a couple of things. We did we did a few things. Don't don't get me wrong. He, his attitude wasn't like that at all. He wanted to make the best record he could. So he said, okay, that's what we'll do. But keep in mind, this guy's been making records forever. He's making records forever. He's one of those guys. You know, he's he's a, a veteran when it comes to that. But still, went in and still said, okay, what do you think? What do we do? What if we did this and this? And so he would always take the suggestions. You know, but we didn't really need a lot of suggestions on that one, on that stuff. But, um, but, and his body language during all that, and since we're talking about that, his was always that one of confidence. And I got this. I know, but it wasn't like, I know what I'm doing, but it was like you felt it. You know, he's a really charismatic guy. And you knew that whatever you're doing, everything's going to be fine. You knew it was going to be fine. One time, and halfway through this record, we were talking, like, and he goes, uh, oh, he was telling me something. He said, have you ever been on something, some kind of plane? I said, no, I've never been on there. I said, oh, man. So he started telling me how wonderful this plane was. It was some, some whatever the airline it was. And the only the only people that have those that are using it this way are in the military. He tell me how wonderful this plane was. Oh, wow. You know, he was setting me up. I didn't know. And he was telling me how great this plane was. And they'd gone to Germany and they'd gone somewhere else and tell me how wonderful it was and how good they treat him because he'd been to, to Afghanistan, you know. And uh, and he come back, and then he was telling me how wonderful and just what a great time it was. And and his uh, manager was there, David Corlew, who was my manager for a while. And da and he was, oh, David was like, oh yeah, that's great. That's a, you know, it was fantastic. Tell me how wonderful this whole thing was. Come to find out later on, he wants me to go to produce his record live from Afghanistan. And he said so. And as I'm agreeing with all this stuff, he's got me around the hook. You know, it's fantastic. So you get down there, you think all this is going to be happening is really safe. You don't think it would be because all this stuff going on. He said, but it's so safe. And I said, wait a minute. No, and then he said, so I want you to come to Afghanistan and let's, let's do my record. I want to call it Live from Afghanistan. Charlie Daniels Live from Afghanistan. And we'll do a lot of these songs too. And sort of, you know, fait accompli. And that's what we're going to do. And I said, wait a minute. You're having a war over there right now. This is back when that was going on. He said, "Yeah, I know." I said, "I'm not going over there, man. Are you kidding me? We'll get you. We can get killed over there. I'm not doing that. I'm not. I don't have. I'm not that guy. I can't go over to where they're having a war. You know? Are you kidding me?" And he said, <laughs> "He said, oh, there's no problem with that." I said, "Wait a minute. Yeah, I said you said you got to fly around helicopters and stuff." He said, "Oh yeah, yeah." I said, "Well, no, no." I said, "People." Every day we hear about those things getting shot down. They get shot down every day they do that. And I said, how do you know we're not going to do anything to get killed? And he says, Scotty, he was, you know, like I said, he always goes, Scotty, I know for a fact, I didn't say for a fact, he said, I know that God watches me from that truck to this studio like he watches me from here to Afghanistan and back. I'm not worried about it. Don't you worry about it. And as much as I wanted to say, I'm in. Yeah, I believe that too. Because do I couldn't do it. I was like, I can't do that, man. I can't do that. <laughs> I'm busy. I got too much going on, number two. And then number one, I'm still afraid we'll get killed over there. You know, but he, man, he was a true believer, that guy. He was into it. And uh, solid. I miss him. What a great guy. 